This episode of Skirmish Supremacy is brought to you by Reformation Brewery, the official beer of your game night. Podcast never. Nah, nothing straightforward. It's not allowed. No. I suppose we should get this thing going because the uh, record button's been hit. And all right, all right. Yeah, well, you know. All right, folks, welcome back to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. And tonight we actually have three guests for a change since we've been scrambling over the holiday season to even get one. So tonight we are uh, <laughs> going to be talking about the importance of play testing for your games, especially for the first draft of it coming out and. uh we got three guests that are coming from three wildly different worlds of the spectrum. We've got Benson Green from Mindward Games. Benson, how you doing? Hey, everybody. How's it going? Happy to be back. <coughs> we have Mike Tunez from Firelock Games coughing in my damn microphone. How's it going, Mike? It's going all right if I can get rid of this cough. <laughs> nice. Nick's over there painting. He doesn't count for shit. And, of course, we have, <laughs> we have Corey Scott from The Witchborn. Corey, how you doing? Hey, doing well. Awesome. This so, is very exciting because uh, 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 Blood and Plunder is uh, it's been very cool to, to, to see develop, and uh, Witchborn is awesome. So uh, it's exciting to be here. Yeah, well, don't sell yourself short on Exiles, man. The last time you were here, yes, we were all hammered. We all had fun. <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, that, I, that was how it was described to me. So I figured, you know, that was mission accomplished. Exactly. We all won because we were all too hammered to remember the rules after a while. <laughs> I think that's why simplicity is a key in that game. Uh, yeah, yeah, we try to be. Yeah, simplicity is uh, is good in, in any game. Uh, I, I at least for me, I appreciate a game with simplicity. Um, if I can't play it when I'm inebriated, not that I'm always drunk when I play a game, but if I can't play it when I'm inebriated, um, I think uh, you know it's not necessarily a game for me. I'm I'm just now getting into Infinity, um, getting all my models prepped, which is taking forever, but. Um, uh, uh, that is definitely not a game you want to be in anything but a clear head to play. Yeah. yeah. Far too many rules going on and far too many counters to counters to counters. Oh my God. You got to pay attention the entire time. What you guys is like the goal. I want to, they want to keep you engaged, mm-hmm. but, uh, man, talk about play testing though, uh, to get, but to, to get on topic, um, there are certain th- some things in infinity that uh, clearly should have been play tested <laughs> a little bit more. <laughs> I'd probably agree with that. <laughs> Yeah, so speaking of the playtesting thing, this has been kind of uh, one of those things that Nick and I have talked about, and I know we've kind of talked with each of you on an individual level coming into this podcast, you know, about experiences and, uh, you know, best practices and pitfalls, if you want to call them that. And uh, one of the biggest challenges that we've always found is that when your game is initially coming out, that getting anybody to playtest it outside of somebody who's like close friends with you is like pulling teeth. (laughs) Yeah. Yep. That's, yeah, that's. And, and not only that, for me personally, it seems like I'm always willing to play some games and get some and, you know, try out new things that we're working on until I have to do it. And then it just becomes a chore. And then I have to test so many things. I just get over. I'm like, ah, I just want to get through it. So I can imagine that it's probably similar for the people who are playtesting for you. And, but, you know, they have much less involvement and commitment to it. So it's just, uh, it's hard to get going. It's hard to get going and get done right. Well, and then uh, you got to manage people, and uh, and then of course there's also the problem of uh, getting value out of um, out of external playtest groups. Um, I, I get my day job; all I do is small group research, and it is it is tough to get value out of group, a group of people, a small group of people, uh, giving you feedback. Uh, it's not easy. Yeah. So Corey, you actually when you, when you approached. The Witchborn, I know that when you and I were initially talking, this is going back 2015 when I was still at CMON and you had the, the little booth with the banner there. Yeah. Um, you were saying that you had a hell of a time getting people to play test it and even just check it for editing flaws. Yeah, it's nobody wants to do the work, right? <laughs> you know, it's like yeah. it's all fun when you want to sit and play. And so some of the things that I found were like, went to Gen Con and I scheduled a bunch of events for a game no one ever heard of and just had like these raw recruits come in and play the game and got a sense of what was working. And same thing, even at the CMON booth, even though 
yeah, we had a game. It was really in its infancy, infancy and, you know, it was just running demos in a booth works just as great as going out and find, finding somebody cold because, you know, at least they're interested in skirmish games. At least they thought the graphics were cool, whatever. They want right. to come check it out. That That's definitely true. In fact, I we really discovered for Blood and Plunder the the real value of playtesting when we played like probably 200 games over the course of a weekend. That was the first time we ever, ever taken the game public and we hadn't finished. We hadn't actually finished the rules yet. Everything was a prototype uh, uh, phase. So we just started to see what was working and what wasn't almost right away. You see the same patterns happening and stuff. And um, <clears throat> I, not that we weren't going to do playtesting obviously, but uh, you really, really see the value of it. Once you get going to like those same game over and over again, same setting. And it makes you realize that, but how important it is. But yeah. it's hard to get. It's hard to go to a convention that size. You know, anytime you need to test something, so you do have to rely on a, a, on a solid group of individuals. And like and like uh, Benison was saying, I mean, <clears throat> it was. Um, sorry, I called you Benison. I'm used to <laughs> like another guy work. But um, it was. Um, I lost my train of thought already because I messed that up. But. Yeah, it's just hard to get that done. <laughs> yeah, it's uh, it, it's de- it's definitely a challenge. I know that uh, hell, even when we were playtesting stuff at CMON and when I was doing it for other companies, the thing that always bothered me, and I, I, this was my biggest irk, and I know you guys probably ran into it too, is the people that just come back and go, "Man, that sucks," and they don't have any other like. <laughs> I'm I've always been one of those guys, and this is gonna be kind of ranty, but like, if you're gonna tell me something sucks, tell me why. Like, give me some form of data i'm not asking for a, a a college paper on it but at least something to tell oh, me come on man <laughs> i'll pull your head out of your ass i do like i i'm here I'm, I'm getting ready to do a mock trial for 40 people sometimes that's all you get from somebody i don't know I don't yeah know. but yeah. i don't know that's important like if you if you have a process you know what you're doing i don't know can sometimes be useful um uh, but it, it's not like, it's not easy. Right. So like, especially from a playtesting perspective, if you're not used to, uh, 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 if you don't, if you don't have like a lot of experience in running those kinds of sessions and whatnot, and I, I don't, I don't have experience doing that kind of stuff with playtesting, which is why when I look at playtesting, I'm like, you know, external playtesting with, with like blind people, like people who don't know, it's terrifying to me, mostly because I do small group research and, I have a methodology a methodology I use in my day job that I know works because I've seen it work over 10 years and we do it the same way every time whatnot. So I know it works and I and I've learned how to how to tease out good information from from people people that you're even paying. We pay good money. We pay 300 bucks a day. Um, I've learned to tease that information out, but for small companies who don't have who don't who aren't doing this on a regular basis or don't have the 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 cash to to hire people to do it um, it can be very difficult to get good value out of that kind of play testing because sometimes you just get people who are like, I don't know, it sucks, it's stupid. The rules stupid. Especially if they're but, all in the same. But, especially if they're all in the same play group because then they have a certain kind of meta and 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 style that may that you may not experience somewhere else. I've definitely run into that problem. Yeah. Yeah. And, but you know, sometimes even, it's good even to know, when you like, get a, uh, it sucks or <laughs> you know something like that. You know, one of the things you said, you know, it sucks. I didn't have fun. Okay, well. You know, that's different than it sucks. You didn't have fun. There's there's something for me to look at because there is something in there that caused you not to have fun. What is it? Not just it sucks. I mean, you can always start dragging that out of people. And that's where it, you know, as Tim said, it can get frustrating when someone goes, it sucks. It's not that these people don't know, you know, they, they may not know how to put it into words, but at least start giving us some building blocks on why didn't you like this? Was it too cumbersome? Was it too, you know, was it too involved? Was there too many moving parts? You know, in, you know, infinity, for example, was there too much to watch out for to try and figure out the AROs or, you know, anything else, you know, while that other person's moving that just slowed down and just made it not fun for me. Or, you know, at one point as we were running a game of Witchborn a couple weekends ago, there there came a point where Tim was beating the hell out of a bunch of little rats 
and it took almost a half an hour, you know, of just Tim and uh, and Robin just figuring out how he was going to abuse these rats, these <laughs> these giant wolves abusing these poor little rat people. Though one of the rats tried to take one of my uh, one of my heroes out on turn one and almost successfully did it, so they totally had it coming, dirty little bastards. But still, you know, and and you know that you know so you know Nate or I might have walked away and went, well, you know, this game sucks. Well, why did it suck? Oh, well, there was a point in time where there was just so much happening that they had to sit there and figure it out, and gameplay had to stop for it. Right, right. And lots of times it's a balance can, too, right? Because if one person has a really bad experience, his three friends might have had fun, but the one guy who got picked on or whatever says, this game sucks. And so you got to figure out what you can do in the rules so that it's harder for three guys to gang up on one or... or yeah. yeah. Or some dude just thinks it sucks, right? Like, <laughs> all right, that dude thinks it sucks. Not everybody's going to like my game, right? That's just the way it is, right? Not everybody's going to like it. Not everybody's going to enjoy it. Um, and, you know, you can you can create methodologies to, to draw good information out of people. You can have surveys. You could use consistent questionnaires. You could do a, a wide variety of research. But the, the question, to, in my mind, as far as playtesting a game, you know, like Exiles or any other game, especially by small companies, is, you know, what's – you know, what's the return on investment, right? And I think with playtesting, you quickly get a rapidly diminishing return on your investment. I think when you're initially creating a game, playtesting is important. It's, it's really important to, to playtest internally, to playtest externally. Um, but very quickly, the more playtesting you do, the less return uh, on, on that investment you're going to get. And at some point, you just got to say, the game is good enough, right? It's good enough. It's, it's like an author who publishes a novel, Right. And it's got, flaw, you know, flaws in it or something's not written the right way or it's got typos, uh, you know, and I think if you talk to a lot of authors like, yeah, it's done, it's published, it's done, it's out there, you know, and I got to be I got to be happy with the fact that it is as good as I could make it at the time. And uh, I'll write something new. Yeah, it's very true. Mm-hmm. You know, especially the, the return on investment, because the one thing I could I could tell you, even like when I was working on the Morpheus engine, I know I've talked about it a little bit in the past, but uh this is so now that it's it's out and everything's happening with it. This is technically the fourth, yeah, fourth iteration of the rules. I had to think about it for a second because I couldn't remember if it was third or fourth. The first time that I, I actually, yeah, but uh, I was I was pretty stubborn when I first started. You know, again, being kind of a noob at it all. But I, I could tell you that like the first time I wrote everything down, it all looked fantastic on paper. Then I had people play test it, and this is the other important part. You are going to get ripped to shreds. Let it happen and take something valuable out of it. Because oh, yeah. I will tell you that my first round of everything I wrote up for Morpheus Engine, people looked at me and said, Tim, we love you. What the hell are you thinking? <laughs> <laughs> We've all probably been there. Yeah. It's hard not to think of first. Yeah, my first draft. Yeah. Yeah. My first draft of the Exiles rules was uh, like 10 times as long as uh, they wound up being. <laughs> Wow. Yeah, it's pretty terrible. And Corey, what were you saying? <laughs> I said it's hard it's hard not to take offense when it's your baby, but you know, you got to you got to take those negatives and figure out, okay, why is this person hating on this so much? Well, it could be it's confusing them, it's more complicated than it needs to be, whatever. You got to distill it down and make it simpler. Yeah. And then on top of that too, like the vision that you have in mind of how something would work just may not be what it is. Like I, so going back to the first draft of Morpheus engine, the one thing that I really was really trying to do is I was trying to find a way to port basically like a real time fighting game, like street fighter, or guilty gear, blaze blue, or any of those into a miniatures game. So I had like rules for like counters and fast ash and you know, all this other cool stuff. And it's like, that all sounds really awesome until you realize that it just spent a minute and a half just trying to punch somebody in the face. <laughs> so, you yeah, know, I that think right- an important point is what yeah, they just kind of made is that you should have an idea, have an idea about what kind of experience you're trying to create. And if you're going to be play testing, um, especially with outside people, um, it's it's important to be looking for whether or not they're having the experience you're trying to create, whether whether or not they like it or not, right? You know, if it might be an experience that they don't like, 
but it might be the exact experience you're trying to create. They just don't like it, right? Yeah. So as long as, you know, as long as you're, the, you know, you're creating, you're, you're creating a certain experience that, you know, that's your goal. I think, you know, it, it's okay if somebody doesn't like your game. That, that's yeah. perfect, Benson. When, when I do demos or I have people helping me do demos, I'm like, we're putting on a show here. You know, this is, this is a play and it may be a game, but there's a story and we're taking these people through the story and they're having an experience and we ultimately want them to win. We want to bring them as close to death as possible. But in the end, they walk away a winner. And, you know, it's a little different game than like Monopoly or something where there's one clear winner. In this game, everybody can win. And, you know, it's it's all about having fun. Yeah. So in speaking of which, when it comes down to, you know, Benson kind of going back to what you're saying and Corey kind of working off of that, you both brought up the, the idea of the experience and, you know, exiles is kind of a Western game, but it's, you know, Benson, it's, it's your, it's your thing, right? Like you and I were talking about it quite in depth where it's like, you know, I'm doing my own tongue in cheek Western. There's a lot of weird stuff going on. Some X files undertone to it. Corey, obviously you've got a game that's very post APOC fantasy. And then you got Mike where it's like, he's like, I'm doing historicals. Like <laughs> I could, you know, it, it, it's not that it's a bad thing. It's just like, he can only, you know, trying to stick within history. He can't have things like Monkey's a Blunderbuss because we found out how bunch that blows up in his face. Uh, that definitely doesn't work. <laughs> Mike, Mike, here's but, here's uh, your uh, here's here's your big tin of glue. You can go sit in the corner now and eat it. Yeah. <laughs> That's the, when we when you go when it comes to game rules, right? Like the setting isn't as material when you're talking about the game rules, right? The game no. rules create a certain experience. Uh, uh, in Exiles, I think in Witchboard. I, mean, <laughs> I haven't played Blood and Plunder yet. Um, but I imagine, again, you're trying to create a certain experience. Um, you know, and I can tell you what the Exiles experience you're trying to create it is. Uh, but the point is, I think we got to a system that, that does what we're trying to do. And that's what we were doing when we were creating the system and doing all of our playtesting. We had an idea in mind of the experience we wanted to create. And we we're trying to get the rules that would create that experience. And we could, I could take the Exile system and turn it into whatever I want. You could reskin it. Right, um, uh, you know the core mechanics, uh, but the point is that it plays the way we we expect it to play, um, and it creates the sort of feeling on the table that we want that we wanted to have, um, and that's you know that's the ultimate goal. Um, it's not, and that's not so. The point is, it's not so much tied to the uh, the, the the fluff and the setting. Um, uh, you should be able to play your game with nickels and paper clips. Right and still have a still have the same kind of experience. No, yeah, exactly. We that's exactly the same thing we were kind of gutting for with Blood and Plunder. And one of the parts that took the longest to figure out, right? We literally spent three months just hammering out how we were going to integrate ships. So because it, it was playing like two separate games, and what the, our vision for it was was that it would be it would all feel like the same game engine, like the same cohesive game where ships is not an afterthought. The playing on the on the grounds on afterthought. They're, they're just kind of an integrated thing. And then finally, after we knew exactly what we were looking for, and then finally, just after breaking it and doing all kinds of crazy stuff, we got to that point where we were happy with what we wanted. And then, and that exactly what you're saying that trend that experience translated to other people, and they were getting exactly what we were shooting to give them. So, right on. Yeah. Well, because I think I think with that one, like the thing that finally settled for you guys was like these are just floating fortresses. Yes, exactly. <laughs> these are buildings. That you can move. Such Which, such a simple idea. Since yeah, you already had all those rules. To be honest, with you, I wouldn't have thought about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, and, and that that is the the fun part with you know any of it because you know going throughout the gameplay you know or you know testing it out and like you said testing it out breaking it getting some feedback from it you know and and then you know just kind of you know distilling it down to well isn't it just this thing right you know. Definitely, definitely an awesome feeling. <coughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> it's good to finally get it when you've had a, such a hard time with it. Yeah. So speaking of breaking it, because I think that's also something that's important to talk about. Uh, Corey, I know that you had some issues when you were first coming out with the Witchborn where people were just breaking it left and right, where you were writing down abilities that on paper sounded solid. And then you ended up having to add almost a paragraph of text to make sure people didn't pull off some bullshit. Yeah, it's it's one of those uh, dangers of a campaign game, right? You normally, if it's a one-off game, it's great. You can 
make a real simple rule system and it's done. But when characters can level up, improve, get better equipment, evil rules lawyers start thinking, hey, if I do this and this and this, you know, what do I get out of that? And, you know. Well, when and you- how the fuck do you play test the campaign system, right? Right. That's the worst thing for Exiles, right? And in other campaign systems, to properly playtest a campaign system, people have to play a fucking campaign. Right. It's hundreds <laughs> of hours, right? Hundreds we're, of we're, hours. We're right? adding a campaign to Blood and Plunder now. So, yes, we. <laughs> I understand that <laughs> sentiment presently. So, yeah, yeah we, it's a pain. You just got to hope. At some, at some point, you just got to hope. You got to hope that it works, and you've got to have a mechanism for fixing the mistakes. And my mechanism initially when the game was released, it was all digital rule books. And so after the first year of play and I got all this feedback from hundreds of players, um, okay, re-release new digital rule books for free. And that seemed to fix a lot of stuff. The other thing that, you know, was really, really interesting was there were skills like without getting too deep into the weeds here. Um, no, if you get this skill, you can't add any other skill that improves your injury roll. And I thought that was a simple enough dis- description. And people are like, well, what about Vanquish? Well, I'm like, well, that improves your injury roll. Well, what about this? Well, that improves your injury roll. So I had to actually go in and write restrictions <laughs> of, you cannot use these 17 other skills if you get this one, you know, because they want it on paper. They want it <laughs> held out so that they don't waste time thinking about it. And then they complain that I the mean, rules are too know, that, This is an issue of, of not necessarily of, of game design, but a presentation. Um, I, I, I appreciate what you're saying, Corey, and I get it. Um, my my uh, my uh, expository philosophy, like my rules writing philosophy and presenting it to the players, uh, is a little bit. It's sort of, sort of polar opposite, right? Where I'm happy as long as there's a rules as written answer for basically everything, right? So I'd be happy to field 100 questions if if I could say, yeah, read the rules. That's what it says. That's what it says in the rules. Um, what I don't like in a system is when there's some kind of hole, right? We're like, oh shit, that shouldn't happen, right? Like. The, 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 if you read the rules on paper and you do what the rules tell you to do, it creates an internal contradiction in the game, b- literally breaks. Like uh, there's no solution for it. Or something happens in the rules that was completely unintended. Uh, those are big rules problems in my, in my view of the world. And, I, and for me, I'd rather um, uh, have a rule set that was trim in, in terms of the way it was written than having to go back and explain – you know, you know, uh, all the little caveats um, uh, to a rule that's already sort of in the text, right? Um, but again, this is my, my personal thing. But that's not an issue of playtesting. That's an issue of, of, of presentation uh, and uh, and how easy the rules are to digest. And I think that's that's a completely that's a completely different animal <laughs> yeah. from whether or not the rules work, right? And that, that's true too, but that's I would also lo- love that into playtesting because one of the first types of playtesting we did was let people read how we presented the rules to make sure that it wasn't just w- us understanding it, but them understanding the presentation as well. So it all kind of falls funnels into the same place eventually. Yeah, yeah, I would I would that's agree good. with that. And you do want those rules breakers out there who are going to try and bend everything. I've got a couple guys <coughs> in my regular group that. They just get off on <laughs> trying to do everything wrong, you know. <laughs> and sometimes they yeah. find big holes, and, and you thank them because yeah. it's like it's a, it's usually like one simple little tweak, maybe adding a word or describing something just slightly simpler, gets rid of the problem. Mm-hmm. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, it's good to have a uh, a rules lawyer friend when you <laughs> when you're writing your rules. Yeah, because I do find that the other thing that ends up happening is like you've you've gone through how many iterations of the rules in your head, mm-hmm. and like to you and your brain, it all makes perfect sense. But until you actually write it down and pass that paper along to somebody else to read, then they go, "Wait, what the hell does this mean? What the hell does this mean? How do I do this?" And you're like, <laughs> "Oh, well, that makes total sense. Like, I already know how to do this." And you're like, "Yeah, that's right. You know how to do it because you're the one that created the rules, you dummy." So. <laughs> Having, my, having that my, is uh, my 
One of my maxims in life is that never trust a game designer to know the rules of his or her own game. Absolutely. Um, because you always have like 10 versions of it in there, right? And you're like, oh shit, wait, that was the way, that was the way we did it three editions ago that you never heard about. Like a good example of this is in Exiles, um, we have misprints on all of our first production run um, uh, uh, character uh, sheets because um, at one point for a long time uh, in playtesting, we were doing 40 experience points for a brand new character and we built all of our pre-made characters with 40 experience points. But through playtesting, we switched that to 45. I, I can't exactly explain to you why we did that, but th- through playtesting, we decided that 45 is a better number. Um, but then when we built all of our characters for the, like, the final version of our characters, we did them all at 40, <laughs> right? And none of us <laughs> thought that was a problem. We read it, we proved it, we, we added up all the numbers uh, because we forgot that we'd switch to 45, <laughs> right? So we had a misprint, right? Because we had it in our brain. So you never, never trust a game designer to know their own rules. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, we had lots of similar problems like that. Uh, there was a <laughs> there was a whole paragraph missing from our rule book in the initial runs. We just put a sheet in there, and I had no idea how that even happened. Yeah, it was for artillery, wasn't it? Like that was yeah, one of the big something pieces. super crucial. We almost I, I, I almost <laughs> I almost died that day when we found that. <laughs> so, yeah, that's yeah. probably the worst when you when you find out it's like oh I've just omitted this whole section of things that would have made it all make sense. <laughs> Mm-hmm. Get, get that delivery yeah. of the books flipping through them all eager oh look at these these are so great you're flipping through and you're like something's not quite right where the hell did this go <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I would much rather lose flavor text than what i would than rules like that <laughs> oh, yeah. that, that would be yeah, you, could, you could that's fine <clears throat> well that's not fine but it's survivable <laughs> yeah well it's better yeah but well, because the game has to function <laughs> Exactly, yeah. <laughs> but at the end of the day, you know, I think I think the people in this space are are pretty uh are pretty tolerant uh of issues like that. They expect their rata. They expect that no game is perfect. I mean, there you can, I think if if you go to most people uh most customers in this space, you 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 probably hear if you if you kind of ask them, you probably hear, "Oh, well, I expect a game to be fully play, play tested. I expect it to work entirely." Um but I think on, on in the reality, and this is this is my experience as a customer myself. The reality is that we all play games that have little rules peccadillos or little problems, and we just fix them. We just worry, or we don't worry about it. We're like, ah, this really should work a different way, or I don't like the way this works, or yeah, there's a hole in the rules there, or you know, this rule is written, rules as written, this is wrong. But I know, I know what the designers were intending, and we're just going to play it this way. It happens all the time. <laughs> Like every yeah. single game, I think anybody plays. Yeah, again, this is an issue for me of diminishing returns. Yeah, everybody does house rules. You know, that's just just the way it goes. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and especially in this industry where it's um, it's a pretty niche industry, right? Unless unless you're like Games Workshop or something, uh, you just don't have as much resources to, and in, in and even in their case, you know, obviously stuff gets through. <laughs> so <laughs> it's the uh, but. Well, yeah, that, you'll have the resources to get it to to do the kind of proofreading and double checking and all that type of stuff that would be necessary. And something like you'd expect in the video game industry, right? Right, where they have you know these massive companies that have that kind of thing. They have that kind of staff and 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 uh, and resources to basically make sure all that stuff is perfect, right? And then you still get errors in that case. So, <laughs> well, yeah. yeah, and I was literally I was literally talking to my wife about that today. I was talking to her about being on the podcast today, and we're talking about playtesting. And I, one of the things I said was exactly that. I was like, oh, you no. know, our first campaign, Troy Hatch and the Scarbelly Gang, it's 30 hours of gaming, right? How do you, how do you properly place as 30 hours of gaming? Like to, to play it once myself, I'd have to take 30 hours with five other people. Uh, and if you have to organize the external playtest groups, they're all going to spend 30 hours with it. I mean, that's like being in the video game industry, having a, a 30, 40 hour video game where you have to literally hire people to play the game. Right. right. You, have, you hire companies that have that are people that just played the fucking game. Right. Um, but for smaller companies, we don't have those kind of resources. So you just can't you just can't do it. Yeah. yeah. You rely on friends an awful lot, you know, you put them through yeah. the bases. We've got an advantage that for since I was in high school, we've had a gaming group that meets every Friday and it's almost oh. every every Friday without fail. And I'm the only one from the original group. But over the years, just 
add more people. And sometimes we're at 14 people. Sometimes we're at four, you know, it just depends what year and where everybody is in their life. But it's been nice because, um, which about the third major game that I've invented, never intended to ever market any of them, just made them for fun for the group, you know, and uh, everybody comes and plays. And so when you do have a 30 hour test, you can play it over two or three Friday nights and, and uh, run through it and, and work it out, see if it works or not. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great resource. Yeah, I, I, I kick myself sometimes for, for leaving uh, Ohio because I went to school at Ohio State. And I kick myself sometimes for leaving Ohio. I had to for work and whatnot. But, uh, you know, I got a lot of friends up there. We had very consistent game groups. We played all the time. And I don't have that as much anymore. Yeah, it's it's a big crutch. I mean, if you don't have it, you need you need to find it. And it's amazing, like, how many closeted gamers there are, you know. I'd be at work, you know, and in the advertising world, and you accidentally let slip that you're playing Dungeons and Dragons or something, and everybody looks at you with, like, oh, my God, you're one of those. <laughs> but, but there's always, no matter where you work, there's always somebody who's a gamer, and you just got to start that group. Because you need that, you need that reason. Well, you'd also be surprised. There are a lot of, I think, I think there are a lot of groups, um, game groups that are established like like yours. And that's another resource if you if you're trying to get a playtest group, it can help to go and find an established group, and you know offer them some free shit. You know, it can be difficult to get people to do to do playtesting, um, but there there are a lot of established groups around, and a lot of them like to try try new things, especially if you can be like, hey. You know, here's some miniatures. Here's here's a book. You know, uh, I've got this great new game. I'd love you if you guys played it. Um, I can run it for you. You know, uh, everybody loves a little bit of free stuff. <laughs> that is true. That is true. Definitely, yeah. We've certainly used that as incentive to get people to to get playing and <laughs> testing and stuff. So it's uh, and it's and it works, right? It's but that it makes sense. You know, you work, you get something in return. Do you- <laughs> Do you guys cast in house, by the way? We do, yes. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. See, what's the great They're thing cast about casting in house right <laughs> for anybody who's looking to start a game company? Mm-hmm. When you cast in house, the great thing is that for for your customers, that miniature is like like a like a five eight dollar thing. They're like it's very exciting, right? For you, for you it's like yeah, it's like. 20 30 cents a pewter and some time right like fuck it have as many as you want i don't care but people get very excited about that right yeah yeah like, I, got, I, I got thousands of these fucking things right it's vincent like, green in one time. sentence devalues the entire industry <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, I, well no I no get... but for me for me too right like when i get a miniature like if i get a miniature from another company i'm like oh this thing is like precious right it's, pre- it's yeah. my precious miniature right i've got i got boxes of miniatures i love and i will be i'm very excited if i get more miniatures um that i don't make right but for me for, for my miniatures i'm like yeah whatever you know <laughs> I, I throw free miniatures and people's stuff all the time it's a great way for people who who manufacture their own stuff to 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 make customers happy because f- for you it's uh the, the 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 dollar value of it is not is not huge Right. Yeah. It's, it's, uh, it, I get accused by, uh, all my partners too here over here of just giving everything away all the time. So I'm Tell always Alex watching carefully. The hell up. <laughs> <laughs> Give away there's more a, stuff. There's right? a reason we don't let stuff. Alex come on the podcast. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. I'm so. a big fan of giving away free, sh- giving away free shit. I give, yeah. I give free shit all the time. Me too. Yeah. Corey, so, I know it's a little bit rougher. Nobody, on nobody's in there. <laughs> Gus got it all printed, so I know that uh, sometimes that can be a little rough on you. Oh yeah. Oh, pr- yeah. Printing is a nightmare. Yep. I I love the digital yes. age. I just did a post on Facebook today, uh, talking to the fans, wanting to know how they want to deal with the rules errata because it is uh, it's become it's starting to happen. Now that the books are printed, people are coming up with weird stuff. How do I deal with this? Inevitable. <laughs> yeah, it's inevitable. Then you missed in playtesting, right? 
right? They missed and played Destiny, but you're going to fix now, right? There's ways to fucking fix it. And people who want to play your game, right? The, and this is the thing about my, my point about diminishing returns, right? The people, some of these rules issues that come up, the people that are going to find these rules issues are ones that really enjoy your game, right? They're already enjoying it. They're already playing it. They're already bought in, right? Um, they're not the kind of people who are going to like look at the rules and be like, oh, look at that problem there. Fuck this rule set, right? And there's easy ways to fix that with an errata or a republication or something like that. So, yeah, you know. it's always simple. It's um, always simple. Literally, it's it's changing one word on a chart and it will fix the biggest mistake that I that I made, you know. But it's it would have been nice to know that before you spent all the money on printing. <laughs> yeah, yeah. So, yeah. Oh god, I, I hate printing. The, Tim and I played the bejesus at a at a one game um for a while. And you know, there was there was a uh, well, you know, one <laughs> one in particular. And you know, there was there was a you know a lot of things that you know kept uh kept cry, creeping up, you know, that were like, well, what about this? Or what about this? And then when you talk to the lead designer, you know, going, Hey, so I have a question ah. about this. <laughs> the designer goes, yeah, I didn't work on that. I can't answer any of your questions. I pass it off to a plebe. <laughs> <laughs> you know, th- th- there is a point in time where, you know, even though you like the rule set and all that, you do just take that and go, fuck this shit. Not worth my time when it's not worth your time to, uh, you know, actually, you know, yeah. work on your own goddamn product. Especially these days, right? When there's so many miniatures games and the games in general coming out all over the place, covering every everything you could ever want to play. Yeah, and so there's one thing I want I, to I, kind of go. Oh yeah, go ahead, Benson. <laughs> yeah, I, I, you, this is exactly what you might have been saying, but um, uh, I think there's a difference between um, uh, like big issues and small issues in in game design. Things that like they're they're gonna you know, like break the game. Um, versus little like things that are like not unclear or that like the game balance is slightly off, right? Or you know something like that. Like you know, and I think customers get upset about a game that 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 doesn't function. That like you keep running into problems and you're like, I, I have to keep stopping and fucking fixing the game, right? Like I'm I'm doing game design now versus you know. I think this particular model is unfairly powerful, right? Like it's slightly more powerful than its point value, right? That's, those are the kinds of things, like my point about diminishing returns. You want to find the big stuff. You want to find that stuff that's going to make your game unplayable or annoying to play or frustrating and not necessarily worry about making the game perfect because you're never going to do it. Yeah, yeah. And, and more to the next point too, it's, uh, you know, in, in that same vein, it's also the way the, the company and the designers approach the errors right if they're just like ah you know whatever just it is what it is we have it how we have it it came out how it came out deal with it if that's the attitude then I, that's when i think nick is saying it's like i'm yeah. not gonna bother with this if they don't care about it right um so obviously you want when you find the mistake if you care about your game you're gonna freak out and try to fix it best you can of course yeah so i i think in that case like that kind of diverges in two different ways so you know, I'm all about house rules. Like, if you're, if you're finding something that it's just kind of like sticking, and your group is not quite grasping it, even if it's rules that's clearly written out, but it's like, you know what, you're you're tired of dealing with it. We'll just house rule this, and everybody moves on, and we're all happy. I don't think any game company out there is going to be pissed off at you for doing that. Where the the problem comes in is like in the case that Nick's mentioning, and obviously, I know he doesn't want to go into detail. Um, I know the the full extent of it. I was standing there and trying not to laugh, but um, <laughs> when so in a case like this where it's like. Okay, if you've got people investing money in your game and like you have this one like even a whole faction that just compared to everything else is horrid. Like numbers wise horrid, ability wise horrid. Like it is bottom of the barrel like for this faction to win means that you're really at this point like your dice had to be golden and your opponent's dice had to be cursed you know, broken where it's like the entire faction. And then somebody goes, nah, what, whatever. I don't really care about that one. That wasn't my thing. Like that, that <laughs> is like, a, that is one of those larger, larger, larger issues. You know, that would be like in, in the case of like Corey with the Witchborn, If like, you know, somebody said, ah, fuck the Norn. Yeah. I've had, I've had everybody write me letters or emails saying, you must love the elves better. Cause they're so much cooler. Or you must love the, 
Paladin's better because they're so much cooler. And it's like, <laughs> they're all my babies. And if they're semen balanced to you, that means it's working. Yeah. We've, we've had, we've run into the same thing where somebody complains about one faction and then the other person who plays the other faction will complain about that, the faction that they are playing. <laughs> so it's, that's a, that's a good sign always. <laughs> that really is a good sign, you know? And I think mm-hmm. as a <coughs> designer, you have to be responsive to the people too. I always try to uh, get back to people when they do email me as quickly as possible, just because I'm not a big company. I don't have, you know, a hundred thousand dollar budget for advertising. I got like a thousand dollar budget for advertising. And so you get me, you know, and it's, and we'll, we'll talk it through and I can answer your questions and point you to the right place in the book to look next time you have the same question. Right. You know, in a case like that, where you, if you were to ask Nick, he thinks the woven are bullshit, but that's besides <laughs> <laughs> Well, well like, you know, like Nick, they're beta it. testing, so you can give me your input on why they're bullshit. Oh, oh no, no. See, every time I say <laughs> something about them, Tim goes, no, they're, they're the worst faction in the game. Yet he consistently plays them. He's the one who's been helping with a lot of the testing and, Wolves. you know, blah, 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 you know, but for some reason, they're still going to be the worst faction in the game. Statistically, That's- they are the worst faction in the game. We're trying to get them up even with everybody, but... <laughs> I don't know. When they can jump half the game board... That's just one model. But, yeah. Except for, <laughs> except for almost all of yours were, and then, whereas everyone else has negatives with slings, you seem to have magic slings or something. <laughs> you need... You need uh, See, Tim's big advantage is not that he's playing the Wolven. It's just that he knows the rules better. Yes. Well, Tim's big advantage is he forgets to tell you the whole rule when you come up. <laughs> There's that, too. So, yeah, that's the other thing, too. When you have people that are, like, running a playtesting cell at your game, make sure that they know them well enough to not completely sour everyone else's expectations. <laughs> um, I kind of fall into that sometimes because it's like I'll, like I've played it God knows how many times, and for some reason, when I explain it to people, I like leave sections out where I'm like, "Oh yeah, it makes sense." <laughs> I think, oh, wait, no, no, I probably should have told you that. Yeah, sorry. Yeah, yeah. and, and, and that's, that's the thing is, you know, also encouraging the other people to uh, pick up the book and look at it and read through it. Yeah. yeah so we've uh, on that on that note, kind of we've so we've done we have our campaign that's going to be in our new book. And we've put that out for a public playtest. And that's uh, that goes to the thing about people not, you know, uh, it being difficult to get playtesters. So I knew that was going to be a hard one. So I said, let's just put it out to everybody. And we've gotten very few <laughs> very few people actually trying it. So um, that goes back to the topic before. But the main thing I wanted to point out was the fact that when you do something public like that, you end up getting – we've gotten um, some feedback, right, from in some emails and stuff where people who have – stated that they haven't actually played the game <laughs> giving us feedback on the campaign and having concerns about certain things which seems a little odd right so uh, really yeah odd. knowing the knowing the rules is 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 definitely pretty paramount to uh getting proper play testing done and even so, knowing the rules is tricky too right because yeah. Mm-hmm. My younger playtesters <coughs> say ninety percent of the ones who grew up on What, what, uh, something just happened. Benson Benson just went on a, a muting screen uh, string. Yeah. Everybody's getting muted now. <laughs> yeah. Tim, you gotta you gotta unmute yourself. There, I did. All right, there we go. <laughs> what's what's going on, Benson? You okay? You you okay, Benson? You talking to me? Yeah, yeah. You you just went through and muted everyone. <laughs> My internet connection must be a little spotty. Thank you, <laughs> Double Tree. <laughs> <laughs> I muted my mic. 
because I was like, my internet connection is spotty. I can't hear anybody saying. <laughs> I was like, I could smile and nod, but I could, I'd yeah. rather smile and nod with my mic muted. <laughs> you, you ended up muting all of us. <laughs> <laughs> and the best part is, is you just had this, this, you know, kind of <laughs> tuned out look, and I was like, I think, I think <clears throat> Benson just went off the deep end. This is what <laughs> happens when you do too much play testing. <laughs> Yeah, it's uh, it's crazy. So, yeah, that's the other thing, too, is getting feedback from people is great if they've played your game. You know, especially in a case like that, Mike, like you were saying, is that, you know, it, it's one thing if people are just getting into the game, but when they come, when they literally come to you and say something along the lines of, oh, I've never played your game, but clearly I see all of these problems. It's like, well, then how the hell do you know it's a problem? Right. So I would, uh, you know, and actually I'm kind of surprised you jumped there because I would point out, Tim, that we have a Robin. Yeah, that's very true. And and Robin, you can you can hand him stuff that he has uh, he has never played the game, and yet he can still go through and and start, you know, putting it all together and going, well, hey, what about this? Or, you know, this doesn't make sense. You know, this doesn't make sense because there's something said here. Um, you know, we, we uh, or I was I was involved in a um, play test some on the fringe for uh, w- one of our previous guests for their upcoming second edition. And Robin had some uh, shoulder surgery. So, you know, while he was sitting there recuperating, they sent out, you know, another, another you know, hey, can people read through this? And I'm like, you know what? Hey, you meet Robin. Robin, meet you. And uh, here you go, Robin. You know, since you're, uh, you know, sitting around and whatnot. And in the couple weeks that he was out on surgery, I'm pretty sure he put them six months behind because they were fixing everything that he pointed out. (laughs) And he didn't play the game once. So, you know, there, there can be some validity to that random person going, hey, I haven't played your game, you know, this and that. But reading this and you know whatever other experience i have these are the thoughts questions concerns that i have because of these things either there's something in here or you know something else that you know just makes me go huh yeah and that's the reading rules part of the play testing i think right where it's uh but if it's if it's for something like uh, the expansion then you have to kind of have some kind of grasp of the main rules to know what it is. Right. So, but yeah, I think you're, I think there, there's definitely some people out there who are good, that kind of stuff. So uh, Fred, the guy who, the guy who basically writes the, the rules for us, uh, he's pretty good with that kind of stuff. He could pick apart those details pretty well. So there's definitely people out there that, can, that have that gift. I missed a lot. Because my uh, my headphones were all messed up, but uh, uh, what I will say is, uh, in my opinion, there there are good places to spend money and uh, and bad places to spend money, or at least less effective places to spend money. I think a, a content editor, a gaming content editor, is really valuable. We've done a, a lot of great work with Dave Taylor from Dave Taylor Miniatures. Uh, he is just fantastic at, uh, at at not only doing copy editing but also doing content editing because he's a gamer. He knows games. He knows how to how to how to how to present rules, and uh, and he does a great job of uh, of tightening up your language and making sure it's nice and tight and says what you want to say. Um, so that's a a good spot where um, bringing in somebody on a professional basis can help a lot. Yeah, definitely. That's what Fred does for us, basically. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah, you have it in house, right? Yeah, you <laughs> so have it in house, thankfully. You. We're fortunate <laughs> in that respect. No, if I had to write if I had to write everything down, I promise you that we would have been out of business already. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know, man. Your models are pretty awesome. <laughs> so, yeah. Maybe we can we could carry it on our model. Our sculptors and our artists are pretty awesome. There's there's definitely been worse games carried by their models. <laughs> yeah, most definitely, right. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So, Corey, who does all your content editing? <coughs> uh, after me, uh, it's mostly just friends. I've got a friend who uh, works in a legal department at a uh, major, major company, and he edits prospectuses. And so he's a gamer, and he loves that really that detailed minutiae. You know, and it's a lot more fun than reading a prospectus. 
Mm-hmm. I bet. Yeah. <laughs> so in that case, you also have somebody who's key to getting that done. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. It's without, without my friends, this would have never happened. They're, they're actually the ones who pushed me into it. They said, you know, there's this thing called Kickstarter and you can start a game and you can get the, raise the money. And I'm like, Oh, that sounds interesting. I think the the key though, is that somebody other than you, right? Somebody other than the designer of the rules needs to take a look at it, whether it's a friend or professional um, or, you know, acquaintance um, because, having a second pair of eyes on it is really, really important. I mean, strangely, a lot of what I do in, um, in my day job, uh, when people ask me like, cause I, I help attorneys prepare cases for trial. Uh, and a lot, a big part of the value that we bring is that we, when we come to a case, we haven't been living with it for five years, right? I come to a case and I'm like, I'm like, all right, it's, I, I've, I've read all the materials, explain this thing to me. And I'm like, okay, well, if you thought about this, right? Cause this seems kind of weird here. Uh, and like, Oh fuck. No, we haven't really thought about that because we've had their heads up our asses for the last five years in the minutia <laughs> of this shit. And we haven't been able to take a look at it from a fresh perspective. So having somebody else be able to come in um, with a fresh perspective is always good, no matter what you're doing in terms of game design or writing. Definitely. Yeah. And, and you get it, you get uh, you know, inspiration from odd places like Tim obsessing about the Wolven on Sunday. He, he sent me down a nice little path, and and we got a fix, right? We do, and it's 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 much better. Nick won't like it, but that's I don't give a shit. Um, well, the point of it is that they got that a makes fix. it better. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, so what, the the big thing that was is in uh, Corey. I hope you don't mind. We talk about this a little bit. But basically, the Wolven were kind of just stuck with a weapon <coughs> to kind of say, well, they need something for a cheap ranged, and it was kind of uninspired. So I was just like, well, it. Wouldn't it make sense for these, since they're hunters, to have something more akin to, like, a bola? And then it just kind of went from there, and now they're getting a bola. <laughs> which, cool. will, which will be a nice little step-up weapon for them. Is it, is it actually a bola, or is it more like a boulder? That's like, version two. That's version two. That's the impact bola. It's, it's, <laughs> the, uh, it's the Nick squishing uh, boulder. Uh, well, I mean, you know, I, I did, you know, switch over to riding horses, so it is it is kind of convenient that, you know, all of a sudden, Tim's <laughs> wolves that can't ride horses because they're too big, they have to ride mammoths, are now going to be throwing little rocks that, you know, may not be actually little, you know, so, you know, taking out a horse, you know, doesn't seem totally out of, you know, Tim's power creep, uh, you know, M.O. <laughs> Everything I do in games is a screw over Nick. No, that's not the case. So. <laughs> yes. But that's uh, it's, 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 it's really, really, when you know the design, really right? Are you are you going paladins there, Nick? <laughs> I, I I did I did try the paladins out, though. I'm pretty sure since Adepticon, you've sped up the dwarves because they were really really slow. And then I was looking through the book, and they were faster now. They uh, they're not any faster than they were at Adepticon, but. Um, may have been a better build or a worse build that you were using at Adepticon. I don't know. Oh, I mean, that's, that's totally possible, but you know, they just, they seem to take the whole game to you know get anywhere. <laughs> Got a sprint. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Little legs sprinting still don't get anywhere. Yeah. <laughs> just remember can... dwarves are tanks. <coughs> build your shield wall and be happy. <laughs> no one is going to hurt you. Not even big, Tim's big bad wolves. Actually, so, actually, that was funny. At Adepticon, I knocked his big bad wolves in the head with my little dwarves and knocked them down. Yeah, that's Tim had the one of the worst games I've ever seen at Adepticon. It was horrid. <laughs> <laughs> it, it really was. I mean, he got his ass kicked by an old lady, and then... <laughs> it was bad. It's all the way around. The game went south for me. But... Uh... Yeah, so one of the other things I was going to mention as well is like we, we were kind of talking about the different games and, you know, factions and whatnot, but balancing out individual characters and like in a case like this, I know Corey Benson, that falls more in your category when it comes down to it. No, because, uh, balancing characters? <laughs> Exile is the co op game, man. We are, I can fudge balance all day, right? Mike has problems with balance because you got a PvP game. <laughs> 
right? You gotta, you gotta worry about point values on your models. That's a big deal, right? The balance in a co-op game uh, is can be a little squidgy. Now, now I, 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 I will, I will say that I don't think Exiles is out of balance. I think Exiles is perfectly well balanced, but um, the balance in a co-op game can be squidgy because what you're balancing in uh, against is perception that um, that your character is cooler than mine, and it's not fair. That's the balance you're trying to offset, right? You don't want people thinking right. that your character just like, uh, why the fuck am I playing a gunslinger? Why should I just be playing a rowdy? Because rowdy is the coolest, right? That's the kind of balance you're balancing against. Um, because at the end of the day, as long as people are working together and they're achieving their goals, it's, it's fine. Um, it's the kind of thing like where in Dungeons and Dragons, like if three three point five, which is full of all kinds of crazy balance issues. Um, I remember when we were playing D and D three point five, um, uh, and the warlock came out, and the warlock was just like spamming that whatever that ray the fucking jackasses had. And they're flying around, and no oh, one the can caustic attack ray, him. the one where they're just yeah, like, yeah, I'm, the... I'm gonna hit you and curse you, and hit you and curse you, and it's like that's all. Yeah, what the fuck it was, right? It's that kind of shit where you're like, man, why the fuck am I playing this game when when Billy can just play his warlock and kill all the fucking dudes anyways? Why the fuck am I here, right? That's the kind of thing you're balancing against. Whereas in a game like Blood and Plunder, or you know, uh, Necromunda, or you know, uh, Warhammer, or Infinity, you're balancing the 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 value of that miniature, and you got to take it take into account count all the different things that thing can do and put a and put a and put a number on it and those numbers have to interact with all the other numbers and those numbers have to interact with all the other factions and their numbers that's a serious issue that's that's serious hardcore play testing right there to, to be honest uh, we've been uh, we hack that's been part of the honestly one of the easiest parts with blood and blunder mm-hmm. and it's not so bad in a historical game as it would be with something sci-fi or fantasy We've got all this fantastic crap that you want to make seem super exciting, right? And then make it, um, and then make it balanced at the same time, you know. Which is, yeah. I think, what games like Warhammer and Infinity struggle with a lot, because they want to have this epic thing that's super cool and kills everything, but then how do you balance that? You know, how do you yeah. how do you make that fit within a point structure, right? Because a lot of times there's a lot of special rules attached. Stats are easy to point and and get balanced. You can just come up with a formula, and it generally is going to work. Uh, but when you come to, when it comes to special rules and, and 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 magic abilities, especially and things like that, I know lots of war gamers have had lots of beefs with fantasy games with, with magic that can get a little out of hand and stuff like that. So, um, do you find yourself finding like a baseline, Mike? For okay, this is you know with these basic ability scores or whatever, this is what this guy should be worth. And then when I add something to it, yeah, we use a points formula. And we just start with a base model with the worst stats possible, starts at one point, goes up from there, equipment will change that, and then um, and then special rules. But the, and the special rules, again, is the hard part. We do have a lot of special rules for historical games, uh, but it's it's not been – most of them aren't really over the top. They're just kind of little quirks and bonuses. So, But there's a little science to it, so you can always – when you invent something new, you can assign a value to it pretty easily. Yeah, exactly. So at this point, it's been pretty simple. Um, uh, so, so we have a lot of new stuff that now the points don't reflect 100%, like we have cavalry, mounted troops, and we've got uh, Native American factions that don't have to ever reload their bows and stuff like that. So there's a couple of things you have to, 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 to work around and tweak, but generally it's not been very difficult. Cool. It's definitely not the hardest part, I'll tell you that. <laughs> and, I, and I think that's an interesting point about, uh, about using formulas. Um, I think formulas are important. <laughs> but I think inevitably what happens is when you have a formula, um, and I think sometimes customers don't like to realize that this happens, but you use a formula and that gets you 90% of the way there, but then you got to tweak it at the yeah. end because no yeah. no computer is going to be really better than your brain. Right. Uh, and that's what we do when people ask us, like, well, how do you come up with your item prices for exiles? Um we have a we have a pricing formula for and that's and it's a main balance thing because the, the the dollar value of your equipment is a really big part of Exiles, um, and so getting the right value on, on all the items is important. And we have we have a, a value we have a formula for every single type of gun has its own little formula for pricing, but we always tweak it. Right, it's, nothing is ever priced exactly uh, exactly as a formula it, it, it spits out. Uh, for a, a variety of reasons, not the least of which is special rules, right? right. Um, and how those special rules interact with the other 
you know, game, the other, the other, the other things that the item does or what, how it, you know, how it interacts with the rest of the game, you know, uh, a special rule might be more or less effective. Um, and then you have to put a little perceptive value on that, right? Like, you know, mm-hmm. you give, you make something a little bit more expensive and people think it's a little cooler and that's, that can drive some perception of a, of how cool, uh, you know, an item is or, or a model, uh, just by tweaking its value a little bit, even if it's not actually that different. And I think part of that's the eye test that comes from play testing, right? You see what yes. people gravitate towards and you go, oh, I can pump that up a little in value or nobody's taken this really cool thing. Maybe I'll lower it just a little bit too. Yep. Mm-hmm. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. And may, maybe they're not taking it because it's not, it's not any fun to play. And maybe that's going to, that's going to give it a, 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 a you know, it's going to give it a little bit of a, of a point saving because, you know, people are naturally not inclined to take it. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, and sometimes, um, <clears throat> sometimes a little nudge on the points here and there just to make something more appealing that wouldn't otherwise be st- won't actually throw the balance off. You'd be surprised. So, yeah. uh, so you could definitely get away with that a lot of times. Yeah, I, I definitely a- agree with the the absolute need for an algorithm of some kind. Um, I swear by it uh, when I'm designing stuff. And again, it, it's like Benson said, is it's, it, it'll get you 90% of the way there, but it's never, you, you never look at that and say, okay, hard stop. This is what the number is. This is what the value of this particular unit or model is. You can't do that because. Well, unless your algorithm is perfect, but it's not going to be perfect. <laughs> right. We're, we're talking about designing it for, you know, tabletop gaming. It's, you know, you're not going to have, you know, this is worth 13.42648994. <laughs> and, you know, like, and then that's going to mean something. Everyone's going to be like, so what the hell is this actually worth? Right. Well, and then there's too many variables to consider in your formula because the, the rules of a thing interact with all the rules for all the other things in the game, right? Especially in a PvP game uh, where you want players to be coming to the table ostensibly on an even footing, right? Like if we decide we're going to play uh, whatever, like if the game is like, what, 300 points, right? If you bring 300 points and I bring 300 points, um, the only thing that should matter is player skill and a little bit of luck from the dice rolls, right? That's what should be defining who's going to win. Um, if you're trying to come to an even footing, uh, you're never going to get there with a, uh, with a, with an algorithm alone because that algorithm is not going to take into account all the different uh, variables of, you know, your local meta game and, you know, the, how, what models you took here and what models did you take and what the scenario is and all the different things that could happen in the game. Uh, there's just no way to, to account for that, at least not reasonably, right? And that's what we're talking about is reasonable game design. What's, what, what's, right. what's possible uh, uh, for, for your company and for you. Right, yeah. If you, if you played a game with no terrain and no special rules and maybe two or three stats, you could probably come up with something. Exactly, right? you can come up with a very perfectly balanced algorithm, right? <laughs> and, it'll be a lot, and, it'll, and I'm sure it'll be tons of fun to play. <laughs> yeah, we'll just, call, we'll just call the game Parking Lot Fist Fight. <laughs> <laughs> Are you talking about uh, Wild in the Streets? <laughs> yeah, but that one, that one, I, I give it leeway because you know where where Chris went out of his way to make sure the rules were really light at the same time. That game is one hundred percent about the theme and just being very yes. tongue in cheek. You know, the fact that I could play a card where it's like we're about to beat the hell out of each other with baseball bats and hatchets, and I go, <laughs> nope, breakdance fight. <laughs> you, know, you know, and it's like, well, what do you? What, what do I do with this? <laughs> or there's uh, there there's some beer. I, I there's some free beer right there. I can't I can't fight right now. I got to drink the beer. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> Unless you're straight edge, then apparently it's okay. Just go take the hatchet to the dude. <laughs> yeah. But uh, yeah, it's th- there's there's various different ways of doing it. The one thing that I've I've seen come out of a lot of companies. I'm sure we all have you know listeners and this collective panel is when people just say, oh yeah, well. I don't really have an algorithm. I just kind of do what feels right. <laughs> and then usually at that point, that's where I'm like, time out, hang on. <laughs> like that's, that, that's the first that's thing. The flag I have. Yeah. Yeah, that's the first, usually big red flag that I have. Yeah, danger do what feels right. In danger. Yeah. After you develop a decent algorithm, then you do yeah. what feels right to, to finish it off. Right. Right. Exactly. <laughs> and then it saves at the end of the day, doing what feels right might work. Right. Um, if you, 
take all that shit into consideration every single time you do something, but nobody wants to do that. It's impractical. It's impractical to do it. And that's what it ends up going wrong is because what you're actually doing is you're trying to do all that calculation yourself uh, without the value of, uh, of, 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 a, of, a, of a system that's designed to handle that work. And so you're going to fuck it up, right? Whereas if you have an algorithm that helps you get 90% of the way there as a starting point, it saves a whole lot of time and, you know, it keeps things consistent, right? So you don't like, oh, today I forgot about this other thing that I didn't take into account. And that's why the pricing of this miniature or this model in the game is all fucked up for you know years is because I was having a bad day, right? Right. Versus let me put in all the numbers. It'll spit out the thing. And I'm like, all right, that's the working number now right? If whatever, it's 10. The algorithm says 10. My gut says it should be eight, but let's try it out. We'll do a little bit of play testing. We'll play internally. I'll play with it a little bit. We'll see what people think about it. We'll float the number out there to some people, see what they think about it. And maybe it'll end up being nine. Maybe it'll end up being eight. Maybe it'll end up being 10, right? Mm-hmm. Um, that, that, that I think is an effective way to do your game design, no matter what game you're designing in the war gaming space. Yes. I, I agree. Uh, I 100% agree with that because I think the other thing you run into, especially in a game, like when you start adding in fantasy or sci-fi and there's like the different races or factions, you know, Corey, and I, I can definitely see this coming from your side where it's like, if you didn't have an algorithm, like there, there's just certain fantasy races that we don't care about, right? right? We all have it. You know, like Nick is a big fan of dwarves, not a big fan of elves. So like if it was, you know, rolls of first, Nick was designing a game and he was doing the whole, well, just do what feels right. You start to like do things based upon a natural bias, so it's yeah. like, you know, yes. like in the case like that, if Nick were designing a game and, you know, just saying do whatever feels right, not a fan of elves. And, uh, you know, the elves just feel like they're forced. You know, it's just like, ah, here's some pointy eared, pointy eared little twerps that run through the woods and wear leaves on their genitals and shoot bows. <laughs> That's an absurdly good point. Um, it actually that- sounds like I named them Tim's then. <laughs> <laughs> Don't judge my weekend. <laughs> yeah, and that's a really good point, though, that that the other value of an algorithm in terms of your game design, your playtesting, um, is that it helps to remove that bias. Assuming there's no bias in your algorithm, because there definitely could be, but it helps yeah. to remove it helps to remove the bias that you're naturally going to have. And that's also why you want, a, you know, a couple of different sets of eyes, even if it's internal, even if it's just you and your business partners or you or your wife or your friend um, looking at it. That's why you want at least a couple of different sets of eyes on it. Because you have your own biases, um, and, it, and it helps to uh, to be prepared to account for those. And the easiest way to account for those is to have somebody else look at it. Yeah. Another thing I found is if you have any kind of trackable statistics, like the Witchborn game actually has trackable statistics, and I've got statistics for over two thousand different games played, and I can compare all the different factions and say okay, well, these guys are weak here, but they're good here and they're weak, you know, and kind of say, okay, does that make sense? Do I want that to happen that way? Because you got to have, you got to have, you know, a couple thousand games in to have it be a fair test with 20 or 30 players, you know? Jesus fucking Christ, man. Yeah. (laughs) That's awesome. I'm going to come out and say that's fucking (laughs) awesome, but not none of me. Right, I am not set up for that. <laughs> so, I mean, if you have it, fantastic. And if you want to write a blog post about how to fucking do that, that'd be great. And I think the skirmish supremacy guys, Nick and Tim, you can link that to somewhere. That'd be fucking awesome. I'd read uh, that. <laughs> I I would read that. I would read that because I I can't I can't pretend that I wouldn't love to have that. But I've I have no idea where to start. I think a lot of game designers uh, would be in the exact same spot to be like, that was that's awesome. How do I do that? Yeah. You play fantasy football and you learn. (laughs) Yeah, that's fucking cool. I got to say, that's fucking cool. Yeah. A very, a very, and and, and, and that's another great way to to get value out of, to get more value out of running games and playtesting is to have a system like that that I'd never even thought about. Yeah, Yeah. even even if if you're getting the results of that game. And you know, maybe the people playing it didn't give you any useful feedback. Really, you're still getting some valuable data if you're doing it that way, for sure. Yeah, 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 yeah. still getting some data. So that, that guy played like an idiot, but we know that if he plays like an idiot, he'll have these results. Yeah, that's awesome. So real 
quick, Corey, is that partly because, you know, you have like the digital, uh, you know, warband builder and stuff like that? Yeah, yeah, definitely. All oh, so stuff. you're cheating is what I'm hearing. Uh, so he's cheating. Well, no, <laughs> he said he had a digital way yeah. of tracking all of that stuff. One of, one of the easiest ways That's is, cool. yeah. is, you know, whenever anyone plays, if, you know, they get the list, you have that if you, you know, work with your, uh, if you work with the Blood and Plunder army builder, you know, and you get people to post their builds and, you know, their game results, which people like posting, you know, usually at least parts of that. Um, I think Corvus Belly is stealing my data. <laughs> I should not be logged into MayaNet because they're just they're just taking my data and using it. They're monetizing it. They're getting yeah. All right, I see what's going on now. All right, all yeah, that's, 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 that's a good really way to do it though. Is through the through the app. Goddamn, <laughs> goddamn! You know AI taking my data. LF. <laughs> yeah, fuck that thing. <laughs> I'm unplugged. I'm gonna go unplugged. <laughs> I'm gonna, oh, ITS, no ITS. <laughs> if, a, uh, if a service is free, you're the product. That's right. That's right. That is true. Um, Corvus Billy has a great system for that, though. Now that now that I think about it, the yeah, like every on their on their forums, everybody's got a little banner at the bottom that has like all their ITS rankings and everything like that. Yeah, I never thought I never thought about them like retaining that data and then analyzing it. I I would imagine that they do. That's a um, good yes. Or or you look at something, you know, another way you you guys could do that is um the global campaign system that, you know, like Dust has implemented. Um yes. so so yeah. Dust Studios has it where you can go in and you can log your game. This is who I played, this is what they took, this is the scenarios we did, you know, and and this is who won and who didn't win, and you can sit there and you can look and you can go, you know, after six months, a year, and you have a hundred, a thousand, ten thousand entries in there, you can go, okay, well, every time this force is taken, not just by this person, but by anyone, they just decimate whoever. Yeah, that's the optimal build. Is it unbalancing? Mm -hmm. And, And if, you know, you, you know, I would definitely go with yes, if you see that every time it's played, it wins, that, you know, that's definitely unbalanced. Yeah. Or you could have a narrative focused co op game and just not worry about that shit. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. See, ben, Vincent's doing it right the whole time. He's like, whatever, fuck all of it. It's... <laughs> but the flip side is that I've got to write, if I want to have a campaign, I got to write like 30 hours of games and on, on like a yeah. narrative arc and like fucking 3,000 words of fluff. Uh, that's the problem. That, that's the drop. It all in one day. Oh yeah, that's yeah. It seems like a lot of work. <laughs> <laughs> Espelon tequila helps, but uh... it does. It does. I saw Hassle Free Miniatures had a whole bunch of Espelon tequila I, on their Facebook yeah. page. I was very excited. Yeah, I saw that. Hey, we're looking for feedback. Plop. It's like oh, <laughs> <laughs> got my attention. <laughs> So yeah, it's uh, th- there's a lot of different a- facets to to play testing that r- really really matter. Um, you know, and it, as much as I, I wish I could say that there's like this this perfect way of doing it, I don't think there will ever be a perfect way of doing it. Um, you know, it, everybody's just different. You know, because one thing I was going to mention before when we were talking about the whole like, well, if you don't like it, house rule it kind of thing, it, it's kind of popping up right now in Necromunda. You know, that's kind of the new hotness that's out there on the on across the wargaming verse because you know that's a game that survived for how long before gw is like all right you fuckers we'll bring it back you know like let let's face it that is one it's of also those, a like, game that could have been play tested all the games workshop specialist <laughs> games are like like every one of those games fun as shit as they are and i love necromunda i love more i love gorka morka but you have to house rule the fuck out of those games yes yes you they're, do they're borderline non-functional yeah, in, 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 in a campaign, so. in a campaign, yeah. like in a straight up game, even even points or whatever. But in a campaign, because the campaigns are so hard to play test, they just spiral out of control. <laughs> yes. But uh, one of the key things they put right in their books, especially their specialist games, um, is that, oh, you know, you, you're doing it for fun. And if there's ever something that uh, gets in the way of the fun, then just house rule it and it's all good. And there's certain people out there now that are just like, no, that is a bullshit excuse. I don't want to hear that anymore. 
<laughs> I think it is a bullshit excuse. I think it's a bullshit excuse. Here's my view of house rules, right? I agree. House rules should not fix a game that's broken. House rules should add to a game for what add add something to a game that it doesn't do. For example, in Exiles, we decided to strip the rules down. We don't do rules for a lot of stuff. Like I have a little segment on my blog that I like to do called Benson's favorite house rules. And these are things that you might think are really basic stuff that should be in the game, but they're not in the game on purpose, right? Like the game rules, rules as written, basic rules for exiles, you cannot give an item to another player during the game. It cannot happen. There's no system for it, right? Because I didn't want to fucking make a system where you have to, like, like to do it right, you'd have to have all kinds of crazy fucking rules for it and like models touching and, but it's just bullshit, right? It's just too much bullshit. So I'm like, fuck it. But it's an easy thing to house rule. It's easier to house rule that. And so our, we, we deliberately decided to not do rules for that. We don't have rules for opening a door. We don't have rules for climbing up a wall. We don't have rules for ladders, right? We don't have rules for those things because I think um, that's the kind of stuff that a house rule is fine for. Like I want to add some content to the game that's not there. I don't think you should have a house rule to be like, you know, to solve the problem in Gorker Marker, for example, where – um, if your fucking truck blows up, you are done for the campaign. That's it. You're done, right? Like if your truck blows up in the campaign, you're never going to be on top again. You're going to be eating shit for the rest of the fucking year because you have to spend all your teeth to buy a new truck while everybody else is putting bigger guns in their truck on their trucks that blows your truck up again. Right. Um, right. That's a it's, fundamental it's a problem. death spiral. Yeah, it's a death spiral. And that death spiral is just core to the system. And if you don't house rule, it's a problem. And I think, I can't remember what it is, but in Mordheim, <coughs> like classic Mordheim, the, you know, there are things that are just optimal ways. There's an optimal way to play Mordheim. It's like, it's like blackjack, right? There's an optimal way to play blackjack. And if you're not playing blackjack that way, um, your odds against the, a house drop dramatically, right? Um, I don't think in a game there should be, there should be an obvious way to play, like one way to play. Um, and that I think that's a problem. So if you have to have house rules to fix those kinds of problems, that's an issue. And I think Games Workshop Specialist games have always historically had those kinds of issues where you're like, fuck it, the game's not going to function well unless we fix this problem. But I don't have a problem with a house rule where you're like, look, I think let's add space aliens to this game. So we'll make some house rules for that. Or I would like there to be some weather systems. I want that, I want it to be raining, but there's no rules for rain. Let's make up a house rule for rain. I think that's a fine rule, for, a fine time for house rules. Yeah, and to me, like, game fixes, I, I don't really look at it for game fixes. It's more along the lines of, like, let's say you run into something where you feel that, like, I don't know, initiative or whatever in a game is just, it's a little too convoluted, you know, where it's like, I could just do this and it's simpler and the game just gets moving faster. Little stuff like that I'm always okay with. But, yeah, if you're, you're right. If it's like, if I got to basically rewrite your entire section of how to shoot said gun, then uh yeah it's, you need to go back to the drawing board not me well and i agree with that if you want to like for example what we, we're playing grunts now in our local my, my local game group we're playing grunts um and grunts has an i go you go system um and we we house ruled it to go to do an alternating activation because we just like that a little bit better we think the game flows a little bit better it's more interesting for us it doesn't mean the game is broken i go you go it works perfectly fine right so, so I agree with you. If you're if you're house ruling um, to make the game more appealing to you in the way you like to play, like you're stripping some rules out. Like, oh, we don't need to bo- we don't need to bother with that. It works fine the way it is, but we like the game will run twenty minutes faster if we just do this thing that changes the rules a little bit. Again, all fine house rules. But if you're house ruling to fix something that's clearly broken, that's that's an issue. Like, and I think a good example here, um, we just started playing Dracula's America with my, uh, I'm getting ready to do a Dracula's America campaign. And I'm, I've been play testing it to develop these campaign rules with my son who's seven years old. And, uh, they have these alternate, these, uh, optional objectives called agendas in a game. Mm-hmm. Um, but one of the, one of the agendas that I got when we were playing, um, it gives you one victory point. If you don't kill, the, your your enemy's boss but the boss is worth two victory points if you kill him and it's the most powerful model on the table right it's just like what the fuck is that for why is that an objective i don't want to get that that's a consolation prize if i fail to kill his boss because out killing his boss is number goal number one because there's a game reason to kill his boss if it had no victory points i'd want to kill the boss 
right? Because it, it, it diminishes effect, his effectiveness on the table. And the boss is also worth two victory points minimum, right? So like that that's like who how did that survive right how did that survive you know drafting the rules in the first place or or any kind of play testing yeah, yeah and it might be one of those things to where it did get play tested and everybody thought it was perfectly fine but then now that it's out there in the public someone will someone looks at it and finally says whoa hey pump the brakes sure yeah. but that's it could have been not game breaking for an idea too like somebody thought that was a great idea and they fought for it and he yeah. didn't listen, you know. That's that's the other thing when you're play testing. You gotta listen to your play testers. If they're telling you something doesn't work, you gotta listen. <laughs> yeah. Well, and that but the other thing is that, that that little thing, it doesn't break the fucking game, right? The game plays fine, it's an optional objective, whatever. And so we're probably gonna house rule it, change that little agenda, start whatever. But that's again, it's another, you know, it's it's not it's not a core system, it's not gonna it's not gonna make the game unplayable. Um uh, the only reason why I brought it up, honestly, uh, was because I'm like, how did nobody notice that? <laughs> yeah. And it could be one of those things, too, where maybe people came across it but didn't see it. Like you said, it doesn't affect the game. doesn't really change anything. It's just, yeah. it's just pointless, right? <laughs> so, well, yeah, it's uh, just pointless. Like, why just more like, eh, I don't need to give it. It doesn't, it doesn't hurt it to be there you know, necessarily. Maybe, so. maybe you're right. Maybe it's just a, yeah. like we've been talking about. Maybe it's a diminishing returns issue. And right. it being pointless, but having no negative impact to the game, other being otherwise, other than being like, what's the point of that? Uh, it was was just good enough. Yeah, mm-hmm. just leave it in. Why the hell not? Right? Exactly. exactly. You just you you made me feel a lot better about Dracula's America. That, that, was, <laughs> that was bugging me. That was bugging me. You know what? I had fun. I played the game. Had fun, and whatever. Who cares? That's right. Exactly. <laughs> the game works. All right, folks, so we're going to start wrapping this up. So we're going to go into some final thoughts. Corey, since you're the big guy on the screen right now for me, just because the way Google's operating, give us your final thoughts on playtesting. It's essential, but, you know, I had an advantage over these guys. I had no deadline. I I don't, (laughs) I work for myself, right? So, I mean, I playtested this thing for six years before I even thought about bringing it out, but, uh, I, I'd say, you know, whatever you can do, the one that really paid it off for me was just scheduling events at conventions and throwing my game out on brand new people and seeing what they thought. All right. And Benson. I got a couple of points. Um, number one, uh, there are diminishing returns with playtesting. So at some point you got to fucking stop and publish your game. Right, because you're going to be throwing too much into it. Yeah. Number two, you got to play test at some point, especially when you're developing the core system. Core system always play test that. Number three, you got to have somebody else uh, take a look at the way the rules are written, because uh, you you are not going to like this. The maximum of 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 writing, you got to have somebody else take a look at it, whether you pay them or not. And uh, last point is that um, if you're going to pay somebody at some point in the process. A content editor who knows what they're doing is worth their weight in gold. Yeah, that's that's a pretty great summary. So, all right, and Mike. Yeah, so Benson pretty much gave the perfect summary there. But um, some important things is basically listen to your playtesters. Have playtesters. Have lots of playtesters. The more play, the more games you play, just the clean the the more issues you're going to find because you will absolutely find issues every time you play test them. If you're playtesting, you're not finding issues, and you're incredibly fortunate. And your game's probably ready to go at that point, right? So, uh, and and as now with our expansion, we're playing for stuff for the game that's already created and expanding that and seeing how that affects the existing stuff. So uh, that's that's a new process with new uh, playtesting challenges, uh, and it, it's I, I imagine it's going to keep getting different as time goes on. So uh, playtesting is invaluable. All right, and Nick. So uh, one one of the things that kind of was mentioned by Corey, you know, with going to conventions and getting what people think is not using just the same group of of play testers. The um, the interesting thing, you know, the video game interest uh, video game industry has been mentioned a couple times, and a lot of times they have the in house people who are who are playing it and playing it. 
And, you know, they have all these checklists and all that. I, you know, I have several friends that, you know, that's what they do, that, that QA, that, that play testing of a video game. But before that game goes out, at, you know, at least in larger studios or whatever, um, and, you know, some of them just do something like an open beta or, you know, a closed beta, but, you know, they're getting public. But they'll also send it to a, another firm going, break it. Because that fresh set of eyes is is going to be able to find something something new, you know. And there's there's been a few times where you know we've we've gotten a hold of a game or whatever, and and we've gone back to the you know writers and gone, hey, so what about this? And they went, oh, hey, we'll we'll sweep that one under the rug and you know fix that because that's not supposed to happen. Awesome. Well, I think we've thrown a lot of data out there. So hopefully for any of you folks out there that are listening to this, that are either working on a game or plan to work on a game in the future, you understand the importance of play testing. That is going to wrap up this episode of Skirmish Supremacy. We will see you next time. Thanks for listening to another episode of Skirmish Supremacy. To see more of the antics that Nick and I do, you can check us out on Facebook at Skirmish Supremacy. We also have Twitter, which we can be reached at Skirmish Supreme because apparently Skirmish Supremacy does not fit in Twitter. And if you want to email us directly, you can reach us at tim at skirmishsupremacy.com or nick at skirmishsupremacy.com. Thanks for listening.